Well, good morning, church family. We have the privilege of jumping back into Corinthians this morning. So um, if you would, while we're all getting set and ready, turn in your Bibles to Corinthians chapter 11. It's Corinthians chapter 11. Now, I want to ask a question, as I often do. Um, show of hands while you're... I'll give you a couple of seconds to use your hands to get to Corinthians. But show of hands, how many of you know or have been on the receiving end of what I deem the look? Anybody? Anybody been on the receiving end of the look? Lots of, lots of husbands, lots of spouses, kids, lots of, there's not a lot of kids raising their hands, interestingly, because I would think that like, if my, in my family, the kids are probably the most, other than me maybe, the kids are probably the most used to receiving the look, right? What, what does the look attempt to communicate, right? So that's an interesting question. What is it trying to, what is it trying to do? For some people, the look means stop that immediately. Whatever you're doing, knock it off. For other people, the look could mean like, did he just say what I think he said? Are you kidding me? Or you like so for some people the look is like the hard stare, right? Like my kids love Paddington. Paddington's always giving a hard stare. But for other people, the look often communicates like surprise, like what? Really? There's so much that that we could talk about that's communicated with the look. But usually, when you're talking about the look, it's communicating something's coming, right? It's kind of the way it works. It, it represents something. It's kind of really most of the time a threat of some sort, a warning. It's a way of saying, don't push it. Stop doing that thing. Let me just pastorally suggest to you, uh, if you receive the look, kids from your parents, husbands or wives from your spouses, if you receive the look from your parents, your spouse, or maybe just somebody who loves you, I would suggest in that moment you ask a question like, should I be doing the thing I'm doing right now? Or maybe a better question, should I stop the thing I'm doing right now? I'm pretty sure that I, I could tell you, if you stop when you get the look, it will go well with you when you will live long in the land. I'm pretty sure you can pull that from Deuteronomy or pull it from Ephesians and Paul and just kind of... <laughs> Popping into this context, I'm sure that's fine, very biblical, that seems right. But we know there's often a threat or a correction looming behind the look. It's a promise of correction or discipline if something isn't done, or maybe if something isn't done the way it's supposed to be done. But without the correction, the look, it's pretty empty. It conveys really very little, right? Right? If you know that nothing's going to follow the look, it doesn't mean anything at all. Who really cares? But I want, to, I want you to imagine with me, if you will, someone who can give the look, but who completely and perfectly knows the thoughts and intentions of your heart. That's terrifying, right? I think... While Paul certainly doesn't know the iterations of, and the intentions of what is going on in the Corinthians' heart, our Lord does. But I think what's going on in this text is that the Apostle Paul is, is kind of giving the Corinthians the look. He may be doing more than that, but he's giving them quite a warning in our following text. It's the hope that they quit doing what they're doing. They're, they're, they're ceasing their division and repenting of it. I think that's Paul's hope. So whether you call it the look, whether you, like Paddington, call it the hard stare, I'm, whatever it is, I think that's what Paul is trying to communicate here. So um, I'm going to invite everyone to stand together for the reading of God's word, if you would. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 
11, beginning in verse 17. It says this, But in the following instructions I do not commend you, because when you come together it is not for the better but for the worst. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of, in the Lord of, of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we will not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. You can be seated. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray for our time this morning. Would you join me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, this is indeed a challenging and and weighty passage in in many ways. And yet, Lord, I think there is something beautiful here for us that if we would latch on to, would refresh our hearts and encourage us in seasons of difficulty and trial. Father, I pray, Lord, that as we read your word as we study it, as we walk away in worship today, Father, that you would, by your spirit, use the word of God to reveal to us nothing short of Christ himself. And that in seeing Christ face to face, that we would behold his glory and walk away with hearts changed and renewed by your spirit. We ask these things in your gracious and magnificent name. Amen. Have you ever walked out of church on a Sunday and gone, what are we doing here? Like, really? Have you ever just had that question? Like, what are we doing exactly? Maybe it was when you were like five. Maybe it was when you were 45. Maybe it's now that you're 85. But have you ever just kind of stopped to think for a bit about what we do and why we do it? Like, sometimes there's maybe a disconnection of sorts. Why do we worship? Why do we pray? Certainly, why do we, as we will do later, take communion? Well, we know in some ways we do it because God commanded it, right? But oftentimes, if we're honest, sometimes it doesn't feel like it means much. Do you know what I mean by that? That you can go through things, you can sing the songs and do the things, but not live in the way that evidence is it's actually affected the way you think and live. Sometimes it's simply because we don't feel anything sometimes. I was talking with somebody this morning, a couple of guys, and said, oftentimes I used to challenge our youth students about the fact that youth camp is always really, really amazing. And I went, well, why is that? Well, it's because the worship is so excellent and because the preaching is really challenging or because this person really you know, like found a way to communicate that truth. And that's That's wonderful and glorious. But when you really peeled back their answers, it came down to because they had an experience and they expected to replicate that experience. And the question I had for them was, what if we just expected that every week, Sunday morning? 
instead of having to go away for an amazing time away retreat. I'm not, there's nothing wrong with retreats. Believe me, they're amazing. But I often think that we show up not expecting much because we're very forgetful people. Sometimes, even certainly in communion, it's easy to just kind of go through the motions and not think about what we're celebrating. So once in a while, I think it's really very important to go back to basics and articulate what it is we do and why we do it. So today we're going to do just that regarding communion. Because really for centuries, Christians across the globe and across the denominational spectrum have all in some way celebrated the Lord's Supper. But I think it's a reasonable question to ask, how does, how does it or how is it supposed to function in the life of the Christian, in the life of the church? What's it supposed to do? So to do that, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 11, and I'm going to draw your attention, I hope pretty briefly, to five points. First is this. The Lord's Supper symbolizes our unity in the body of Christ. Right? If you recall... Paul had already talked about the Lord's Supper in chapter 10. He talks about whether believers should eat food offered to idols or not. And it's clear to Paul that if they're eating in anything that's connected to some kind of a pagan ritual or some kind of worship of an idol, they're to steer clear of that thing. If it's ceremony in a pagan context, he commands them to avoid it entirely. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 10? We talked about this several weeks ago. Verses 14 through 16, he says, My dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And if you recall at the time, we talked about how that should probably be rephrased in the original language. Because it's not that we participate in Christ's blood by drinking. The word participation is always almost in the, in the New Testament translated as fellowship. We have fellowship, and that's different. That's what's at stake here. So what he's saying is, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a fellowship of the blood of Christ, meaning it's an expression of our unity. We have fellowship in the blood of Christ. We don't participate in the blood. We, have, we are the fellowship functionally of the blood and of the loaf, as Paul would say. He says the same thing regarding the bread. Is not the bread that we break a fellowship in the body of Christ? And then what Paul gets at seems to become even more clear in chapter 10, verse 17. He says, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. See, the, the loaf is supposed to remind us that Jesus' body is broken on the cross, but the New Testament language goes further than that. Right? It sometimes speaks of the body of Christ as the church. We can actually make another connection because if the body of Christ is somehow symbolized in the bread and the church is the body of Christ, then there is at very minimum sort of a symbolic connection, at the very least, between the bread and the church. The text says, because there's one loaf, we who are many are one body. So when we take the bread... We're actually saying we all belong to, we're all part of the one body, just as this bread has all come from the one loaf. We're all one. There's, there's great unity in this idea through Paul. And in fact, one of the things you see throughout the next several chapters is it all appeals back to unity. We're going to get into this pretty heavily as we get into spiritual gifts and tongues and prophecies and a whole slew of things. And at the end of his treatise on it, Paul continues and finishes the thought on chapter 13. I could do all these amazing things, but if I don't have love, it's all worthless. This idea of unity is big for Paul. But what happens here in chapter 11 is actually what's really interesting and in why the language is so strong in our chapter here is because unity is what's at stake. So if you notice the beginning of chapter 11, Paul's kind of dividing some things into sections. He says, oh, in this, I'm going to commend you. But at the end, in 17, that second half, he says, in the following directions, I have no praise for you. I will not commend you. For your meetings do more harm than good. 
ouch, right? Sounds a little bit like Amos, right? Where God just says, I wish that you would just shut the doors of the temple. Malachi, same thing. A lot of the prophets in the Old Testament, your feasts, your new moon festivals, your this, your that, your feasting, I want none of it. There is stench to me. This is sort of like Paul kind of saying the same thing. Your, your coming together is not accomplishing the purposes it's supposed to. In other words, the one place where you should be most united is where you're most condemned. That's really shocking. He doesn't condemn them for divisions over tongues or hats or whether you're supposed to put something on your head or not or whether or not you eat meat to idols. But he does so in how they do communion. Why is that? Look at verse 18. He says, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe you. It's classic Paul, right? He's bitingly sarcastic. Of course he believes they're divided. He spent like the past 10 chapters explaining how all the ways that they're divided. Over and over. You're divided over this. You can't even, you can't even solve disputes. You're taking each other to court. You're divided over uh, whether or not a divorced man can do this or whether or not you should marry or what women and men are supposed to do in the church. You're divided over literally almost anything you can be divided over. So what does he say? He continues, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anyone else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat or drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. Think about that. Do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? So, Paul's making a connection between how they are treating others in the fellowship meal and the love feast. And by not treating them appropriately, he's asking the question, do you despise the church of God? That's a strong, strong, harsh critique. It's really important to note that it's likely due to the way that people worked in that culture, right? They didn't have these things that we love called days off back in the day. If Christians wanted to gather on the first day of the week, they didn't just show up like this at like 1030. I've had my coffee. The kids are in a good state of mind. Everything's fine. I've eaten breakfast. I feel like I'm not hangry right now. That was not their experience, right? Most likely, they had to meet really early in the morning. Some men's and women's Bible studies know a little bit of what that's like. Or later at night. And, and beyond that, many were slaves. They couldn't even get away from work until really the evening, way into the evening. Or those that were in commerce and they had to work as well. Christians meet very early in the morning and late at night. And you can imagine what might happen. Right, Those people with more means, who needed to work a little bit less, who may not have been slaves or may not have been in the trades, would show up and functionally they're like tailgating communion. They're like pre-gaming it, right? They're showing up and they're like, all right, let's get the appetizers going. Like they're going to, somebody cracks a bottle of wine and then that turns into five bottles of wine and they're firing up the grill And they're feasting, and they're taking something that they're supposed to be celebrating, their unity in Christ, and the very people that can't get off work until much later show up, and maybe they grab like a crust of bread or something from their master's pantry, but they certainly didn't have like the pasta and the meat and the this and the that and all the appetizers like some of them did. They came in later. So this meeting when they're breaking bread together, when they're supposed to be celebrating the cup together, supposed to be celebrating the unity they have, what happens? It sounds like it turns into a pretty big disaster, according to Paul, right? So he says, the very thing that you're supposed to be doing, this love feast, this celebration, this unity, it becomes a stinging point of division between the haves and the have-nots. What's happened is 
the exact same thing that occurs out in the culture has made its way into the church. There's no distinction between how the church is being different. So he says, shall I praise you for this? Paul says, certainly not. Verse 33, so then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone goes hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. Paul's saying this is not a time for partying and showing off. It's not a time for division. It's actually a time to express the unity that we have around the Lord's Supper. Right? We're not quite so structured today. We're all here more or less on time. As far as I'm aware, nobody brought a bottle of wine this morning. No? Anybody? Bottle of wine? It's the Baptist church, just saying. Just want to make that really clear. Nobody brings a crust of bread and others are bringing caviar, right? I do think that, as, a, as an aside, I'm very much a fan of, of church potlucks, especially in coinciding on the, the Sundays that maybe we should celebrate communion together. Not every single month, but a couple times a year. I think in the future, I'd really love to have a church potluck where we gather and enjoy something similar to a church picnic. But hey, what if during that time... I don't know, we celebrated communion together because we're unified in the blood of Christ. That's an aside. But is it true of our churches today that we often bring along all of our divisions, all of our biases and prejudices, all of our bitterness and our hurt feelings, So the exact moment when we're supposed to remember that we are all sinners before a holy God, instead, all of those frustrations and bitterness are just suppressed under the surface. And the whole meal, the whole celebration, has the stain of hypocrisy to it. Church family, in a few minutes, we're going to eat and drink together. And what it should function as is a time to confess our pride, to confess our arrogance, our selfishness, and to love one another in unity for the sake of Christ, and to remember and celebrate that, in fact, we are one in him. So point number one is that we are to be unified, or we are, the Lord's Supper shows our unity in the body of Christ. Point number two is that the Lord's Supper shows our unity in the death of Christ. Paul writes in verse 23 to 25, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. You know, as well as I do, the vast disputes across church history that are about the exact significance of the Lord's Supper. I'm not going to try to tackle all of those disputes this morning. That's, that's a Sunday school conversation. Um, what is really clear is that there seems to be an incredibly great evidence of remembering what Christ has done. I actually happen to believe that while we're not physically nourished in the presence of Christ... We are spiritually nourished in the presence of Christ. That there is something nourishing spiritually that goes on when we partake together. I will not say more or less than that now. Ask me what I believe. I'm happy to tell you. But I'm also persuaded that one of the reasons that God gave us this really, really simple act to do over and over and over is because we're a very, very forgetful people. Right? Right? Imagine the kind of things that we think through during a week, let alone a year, or even just, not even you personally. Imagine the kinds of things that the church thinks through corporately through a year, right? So I've got to preach sermons on the spirit. I've got to preach sermons on evangelism. I've got to preach sermons on the doctrine of God. There's got to be sermons on how to handle wealth. There's got to be funeral sermons, wedding sermons, right? You get the point. And then you have Sunday schools and small groups and all the wonderful things that come with them. Bob has to worry about the building and whether or not there are toilets leaking. 
The elders and the deacons have to think about who's being served and when the concrete is being poured for the pavilion and how to wisely steward the resources of the church. The elders are praying and teaching and shepherding the church and finding ways to care and serve the community. We have building communities, budget commu committees. We have relationships in small group. We have dynamics across all of those lines. You have to consider how we're using our budget, how we're supporting our missionaries, how we're caring well for them. We have to think of each ministry in the church and how we're going to love and care for and teach our kids and our students, our families and our retirees, how to love and care for those who are homebound. So simply in the life of the church, let alone your individual life, which is far more complex technically, you just have more things that you're doing in a day in your family. It's really possible that you can go month after month, week after week, year after year, and not spend more than a few minutes once a month meditating on the death of Christ. But here, in communion, in this very simple act, Christ is insisting with us that we go back to the basics. What's he say? Do this in remembrance of me. And in some ways, you think to yourself, like, how tragic is it that Christ felt the need to say that and to give us something to remind ourselves over and over and over? In the sense of, like, if you were to ponder the death of Christ, how crazy is it that we can care so little about gaining heaven and living in holiness before God when we contemplate the death of Christ? How silly is it that we don't have a very passionate burning desire to see the lost come to Christ when we celebrate communion? How silly is it that we don't have this all-consuming desire to, to worship God when we understand the height and depth and breadth and length of God's love for us? You understand, like, the, the crazy dichotomy of that? If we truly understood what Christ had done, it would reflect in ways differently than how we live. And yet, because of sin, Satan, the fall, and a whole slew of other reasons, we are a very forgetful people, right? What communion is supposed to do is it's a reminder of the gospel, brothers and sisters. It's supposed, to, it's supposed to say, tell me that story again because I'm so incredibly forgetful. Tell me, remind me, encourage me and refresh my heart with the death of Christ and how much he loves me and how he wants the glory of God and why he went to the cross, why he looked ahead at what was before him and went anyway. Point number three. The Lord's Supper shows us unity in evangelism or unity in proclaiming the gospel. We read in verse 26, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Right, the word proclaim here is the regular word that Paul uses for preaching and, and teaching or heralding and evangelizing. It's a proclamation of sorts, so that, that really is translated well. Right? And we, we kind of think, okay, we take the Lord's Supper. What are we proclaiming, right? It's for believers. So what's going on here? We know the Lord's Supper is for believers. We don't use it to evangelize. It's for believers. But brothers and sisters, I, I don't think that's the way it works in the New Testament. Right? The New Testament church was interested in having non-Christians present at all kinds of meetings, including the Lord's Supper. It doesn't mean they participated with believers in the Lord's Supper. But the Lord's Supper should, ought to, function evangelistically. When we take communion, we're acknowledging that Christ needed to die for our sins, yours, mine. In the same way that when, when the Passover was instituted, it was a, a reminder of what God had done. But oftentimes, when it was, when it was eaten the typical Jewish thing would be to, to imagine that they were there as the, the disobedient people that needed the saving blood of the Lamb. 
to imagine that they were the ones who were pulled from Egypt. In the same way, we identify with the blood of Christ that the way that we talk is, is not just that like sin put Christ on the cross. Yes, that is true, right? But whose sin put Christ on the cross? Well, there's our sin, right? We should think that way. That's fair. That's honest. But more importantly, it's my sin that put him there. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished, right? Your sin and mine. But what we also proclaim is not just that we're acknowledging that Christ needed to die for our sins, but we proclaim his death as the payment for our sins, and we proclaim that salvation is possible because of the shed blood of Christ. One author puts it this way. Think about, think about this quote in our secular, pluralistic society. He says this. He says, if salvation is the experience of illumination, then perhaps Buddha saves. If salvation is the experience of union with the cosmos, perhaps Hinduism saves. If salvation consists of being faithful to one's ancestors, then perhaps Shintoism saves. If salvation is being freed from the oppression of the bourgeoisie, then perhaps Marxism saves. If salvation is material well-being, then perhaps capitalism saves. If salvation means feeling good, then perhaps there's salvation outside of Christ and outside of religion. But if salvation is the liberation from the powers of sin and death, then only Christ saves. Amen, Amen, right? That's worthy of a clap for sure. When When we remember what we have been saved from, Right, the very power of sin and death, and what we have been saved to, nothing less than the eternity in heaven in the very presence of Christ, well, then the Lord's Supper can and should become an evangelistic proclamation. Do you see that? That's what the text says. It says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim the gospel in anticipation of Christ's return. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that that taking communion is not something we're going to be doing in heaven? That's not going to continue in eternity. When the new heaven and the new earth finally dawn, no one's going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper, it would seem, from Scripture. Because our goal is not to meet as a church around the Lord's Supper and just to remember his death. That's a thing that we do. But our ultimate goal is because on account of Christ's death to meet the risen Christ himself in the new heavens and new earth. Right? That's the hope we have. But until that happens, every time we gather to participate in the Lord's Supper, we actually gather in unity of anticipation of that glorious day when we shall eat with him and we shall see him face to face. Point number four, the Lord's Supper gives us unity in repentance. It's verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now, it's important to understand that the text really does say in an unworthy manner, but it's not that you and I are worthy or unworthy, right? It's not we who are worthy or unworthy, but the manner in which we approach. Because if it were about our worthiness, nobody should ever take communion. Do you understand that? We only take communion because Christ alone was worthy to take the sting of death for us. That's not what's going on here. It's actually talking about how we come. Of course we're unworthy. That's why Christ died. But there can be a worthy way to approach the table. And it's not based on any goodness in in us, right? It's not based on our worthiness. It's it's like this. How can we possibly come to the Lord, to the Lord's Supper, really, and say, I remember Christ. I remember that he died for my sins. And then walk away and not actively try to be killing sin in our lives. Or how can we come to the table and say, I remember that he died because of my sin, because of my bitterness, and then go on in bitterness to somebody else. Or to say, I remember that he died to forgive all of my hate and all of my selfishness, when in fact, 
I am all about me all the time. That's what it means to approach in an unworthy manner. Yes, we're sinners. Yes, we need forgiveness. No, we are not ourselves worthy, but we should not approach the table that focuses on Christ's death in a manner in which we care so little for our sin. That's why he says, whoever drinks or eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So what then is a worthy manner to come? He says man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Again, throughout church history, there's all these kinds of questions and theological debates on what's going on when we partake in the body and bread of the Lord. Some have understood it to mean and recognize that the, the body and blood of the Lord are in the elements themselves, as if somehow that bread and that drink becomes divine. I don't think that's what Paul means here, because what Jesus meant when he said, this is my body, he's still saying it while he had his body. You understand that? Like, he's in a body saying, this is my body. Well, it's clearly not his body, because he's not going, here you go. It's still a really hard saying, agreed. But any more than Christ can say, I am the bread of life, or I am the door. Well, is Christ a door? No, but yes, right? Is Christ the light? Well, yes. Is he light? Yes, if you take John 1, for sure. But my point is that Christ is no more physically in the element than he is a door. Anyway. Some other people take this to mean that the body here refers to the whole church. Um, He says mostly that Paul's concerned of the way that Christians treat one another. And I'm actually compelled by that argument. I think the larger context shows that Paul is very concerned with the way that Christians treat one another in the church. He says anyone who eats or drinks without the body of the Lord, that is meaning the whole church, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So it's really possible in the larger context that he's talking about not just discerning the body personally, but discerning the body corporately. And I think that's fair. But to err on either side, where he's only talking about the body and how they're just fellowshipping corporately, is probably not understanding Paul's logic. Nor is it fair to sit over here and say, as we often do, Uh, confess your sins before the Lord, examine your hearts, so that like in the 30 seconds that we give you while the band is kind of quietly playing something in the background, you're like, dear Lord, forgive me for all the things that I've done that I can't recall right this moment. The omission sins, the commission sins, and everything. Check the box. Eat the bread. It's not just a checklist to kind of make sure you've you've approached in a worthy manner. It has to be both because it's lived out in the life of the church. You understand that? There's a personal aspect of this and a corporate aspect of this. To deny either is probably not fair to to the text. I would actually say it seems to go against the entirety of the flow of Paul's logic. Here's why I say it's both corporate and personal. Look at the warning in verses 30 to 32. Some, you see, do not examine themselves, and they take the elements. And Paul says, this is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were to, if we were more discerning, if we were to discern and judge ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that he will not finally condemn us with the world. I know it's hard to look at that kind of language and say drinking judgment upon myself is not something I want to do. I don't want to drink communion, partake in an unworthy manner, and get sick and die. That's fair. I also have to insist that not every instance of sickness and certainly not every instance of death is a direct result of some specific disobedience. You have to look no further than the Gospels themselves to see that. 
John's gospel, you see a man who was paralyzed for 38 years because of his sins. That's John 5. John 9, the man who was born blind had not been blind because of any explicit sin or he or his parents had committed. You see that often in the Old Testament. There's generational sins. But you see just as much that that's not the case. Does it happen? Yes. Is it always? No. I think that's a fair understanding for what's going on here. There's no one-to-one connection between sickness and some specific sin. But that does not rule out the fact, brothers and sisters, that in some instances, some sickness and some death may be the result of some specific sins. As we look through the entirety of Scripture, it's often a sign of God's mercy and power in the church when such things take place. Paul's actually saying that some instances of illness in the congregation, some instances of death, are nothing less than God's judgment on those who dare to approach the table of the Lord so lightly. Why? Really, really listen to this. Because God doesn't want his people to be condemned along with the world. So that he might correct and judge to clean up his church. And in fact, we should actually take great comfort in that. God has not left us to ourselves, brothers and sisters, but has promised to discipline and correct us because he loves us and because he is zealous for a people who bring glory and honor to him. So what we have in our passage this morning, I believe, is Paul giving the Corinthians the look so he doesn't have to come with discipline and so that God himself might spare the rod. So brothers and sisters, come. Come joyfully and freely to the table as you let go of your sin. Examine yourselves this morning, confess your sins, and come before the Lord's table. This is a great time, a moment that we get to remember Christ's death and to remember the incredible hope we have for heaven. All of the empowerment that is available to us to fight sin and live an abundant life in the power of the Spirit. It is a reminder of everything that we will behold in the new heavens and the new earth. It's a reminder that nothing short of Christ himself, the salvation that is available to him, to us alone, through him alone, is won and secured by his death, which we're going to remember. So come in the name of Christ Jesus and enjoy together. In just a moment, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. And as we often talk about fencing the table, if you have repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ, and you've examined yourself, nothing more and nothing less than what Paul says in Corinthians 11, then I would welcome you to partake of this moment as we remember Christ's sacrifice for us. You do not have to be a member of this church in order to partake with us. If you're not a believer, then I'd simply ask for you not to take this. Because what you need is, in fact, not the snack of a piece of wafer and some juice. You need the Christ that they represent. So I would ask you, in fact, what's keeping you from coming to Christ today? What is keeping you from laying down your burdens at the cross this morning? What's keeping you from allowing Christ to draw you to himself as your savior right now? Lastly, if you're a child or a student and you've not repented of your sin and placed your faith in Christ, I would suggest that you watch your parents. Mom and dad, it's your job, in fact, to teach and train your kids about what we're doing in communion. I am happy to be a part of that. All of the elders and all of those who teach are happy to be a part of that, but it is not our responsibility. It is your God-given responsibility to share the gospel with your kids. And it is our prayer that today is the day that faith becomes real for your entire household. So, with that, would you partake of communion with me? This time our passage will be from our very scripture here in Corinthians. Paul says, For I received from the Lord 
Well, I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. the same way he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes